Thank you for that. Nope, I'm supposed to sit there. No. You're supposed to sit there. there. I was told I'm I was told I'm on the far left. For me that's not <laughs> Look at that. I got to tell the music director what to do. <laughs> It'll be the last time that ever happens. I'm Robert McBride. You know him. This is David Dunsmeyer. Hello everybody. In his first season as music director of the Oregon Symphony and having a great time as far as I can tell. I enjoy it very much. Good. I love the orchestra. <laughs> and this man, on your first trip to Oregon? Yes. Yes, yeah, on his first, first trip to Oregon, Oregon, guitarist Daniel Desiderio. Thank you. Thank you. You can't always tell from looking at someone what they do for a living. Sometimes you can with violinists and violists. They'll have this little spot on their neck over here where you know, there's a thing there all the time. Uh, some truck drivers, you know, the left side of their face will be kind of weathered compared to the right side. Classical guitarists can kind of tell from their fingernails. The nails are likely to be longer on the right hand than on the left, and they're extremely well maintained. Because they have to be, right? Yeah, it's so important, the nails. I mean, the nails for a guitar player is like the bow for the violin. Without, it's impossible to play classical guitar. Yeah. So how much of the time are you plucking the string with the flesh and how often with the actual nails? Oh, no. We never touch the string with the, with the meat, let's say. Eh? No. Only with the nails. That depends on our sound on our art articulation, dynamics, everything. Ah. Yeah. Does guitar music indicate fingerings, or do you figure that out for yourself? Well, no, uh, there are some advertisements about fingering on the score, but then you choose and then you, you create your own fingering. Okay. It's so important and for each, each one of us, it's a different way. Right. David, have you ever played the guitar? <laughs> I've played a little bit of electric guitar when I was uh, a teenager, but very badly, unfortunately. I didn't well, practice a lot. And, and you've played electric guitar. I started with electric guitar. So how long has it been since you plugged in a guitar? Well, I started when I was six. <laughs> huh? Electric guitar at the age of six. Because my father was a drum player in a pop band. Oh, that's adorable. So his idea, I have two brothers. They are violin players and piano player. And his idea was to make a group, <laughs> huh? a pop band. <laughs> but, uh, but then we chose uh, the classical music. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want you both to know well, you, you both probably know who Jerry Garcia was. You don't? Guitarist with the Grateful Dead. Oh, oh yeah, uh, Grateful yes. Dead, I know. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's sure. Jerry Garcia yes. for many, many years. Yes. And I mention that because I wore this tie in your honor because he designed it. Wow, really? yeah. great. I don't know how it is that Jerry Garcia designed neckties. I don't think he ever wore one. But he did, so I, I wore this for you. There Great. are some multi-talented people. By the way, I just wanted to mention one thing because I hear often when you know a musician performs, you know, as a performer, people say, "Oh, you know, you must be so talented." I hear a lot about talent, right? I am the absolute proof that talent alone is not enough because I was really a bad electric guitar player. You know, I played some <laughs> concerts in a band and it was dreadful. And I think, you know, I, I, I would consider myself as a talented musician, but I didn't put in the hard work on the electric guitar, so the result was I was pretty terrible. <laughs> Leo Brower, who we must talk about tonight, because the concert begins with his music, was an amazing guitarist until he had an injury and he had to stop performing. So, composer, arranger, conductor, administrator, composer of over 60 film scores. You may have seen at least one of those. A Mexican film called Like Water for Chocolate back in the 90s. Yeah, he wrote the music for that. So usually when a soloist comes to town to play a concerto with the orchestra, they play that concerto and nothing else unless they add an encore. But the Agnello is featured in the first two works. He's playing the whole first half of the concert. Was that your idea? Well, both we decide. Uh, and, um, because, you know, Rodrigo, of course, Aranquez is the most famous concert 
uh, all around the world. But Brower is the hero of the classical guitar of the 20th century and this century. We, uh, we must um, thank him a lot as a guitar player because he really, with this composition, he changed completely the way of thinking about uh, sounds, accents, and colors on the guitar. So each time uh, we play Brower, it's uh, absolutely a pleasure for us. Yeah, especially for you. He's 82 years old now, and you know him, right? Oh, yeah, I know very well him. Uh, I studied with him uh, different years. I was following him all around the world. Some days before, he always called me at that time and said, Aniello, in three days I am, I don't know, in Madrid. So I was traveling all night just to be with him half an hour and to play for him, eh? because he is incredible. I had a beautiful and incredible maestro when I was young, but he completely opened my mind. Uh -huh. He put me far away from the score and to discover what Gustav Mahler said once. No, uh, um, I will never forget, I, I always try to remember this phrase of Gustav Mahler, which Brauer told me, and Mahler said that the composer into the score wrote everything, till the last detail, except the essential. <laughs> so Brauer tried to teach what essential is. Oh, mm? that's really good. How did you two meet? I was, <laughs> we're trying to figure out, we know where we met and which orchestra it was uh, in Germany, in Koblenz. And uh, he was uh, the star of the guitar festival and was uh, one of the things that he did at the festival, among many other things, was that uh, he played a concert with the orchestra there. And it was a piece by Brauer, Concerto del Lieli. And I think it was the Fantasia, Paro and Chelsea. You see, I still remember the program. It was the Fantasia and then it was Firebird in the second half. Mm -hmm. We are still trying to figure out how the invitation came to me. I was a very young conductor. Somebody called me, I think, saw me winning a competition, some, some prize. Or so I won in Salzburg at the Bernhard Baumgartner Medal or so something. And they kind of like heard my name. They needed a conductor. I got called. And uh, we didn't know each other before at all, and uh, I had not conducted the pieces, so I was like, uh, yeah, <laughs> poor Aniello, you know, has to deal with conductor who doesn't know the piece. You know, I, of course, learned the scores, but didn't have, have not conducted it before. But we immediately got along extremely well. Like, Absolutely. from the first meeting, you, you could tell do, this is a I fantastic uh, friendship. You're still happy to be working together here today. Yeah. Absolutely. Nice. Yeah, we've worked a lot over the years. We've worked many. We talked, actually, two days ago, pinpoint all the orchestras we've worked uh, it's like a fifth or sixth time now that we work together i want to mention a couple of small world things if you pay a lot of attention to this orchestra and this man you probably know that carlos kalmar the previous music director was part of a conducting competition when your father was on the jury that's correct so there's that connection the previous music director here was james de priest and you were in a conducting competition when he was on the journey. That's correct. <laughs> so that's fun. I mentioned on Facebook something that I should now follow through on because I said I would. Leo Brower is related to the man who wrote Malagena, which was a super popular song for quite a while. And he's also related to the composer of Babalu, which Desi Arnaz made so famous. And Brower studied at Juilliard with a composer named Vincent Persichetti. His nephew plays the flute and is a practicing dentist in Portland. Yeah. Oh. Piccolo mondo. <laughs> yes, yeah, you mondo piccolo. The music world is generally small. Uh -huh. it's, it's, very, it's very small. Surprisingly small sometimes. So you have to be careful what you say and what you do. In, 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 so, in some ways, yes. Uh, I mean, like, you should uh, maybe, maybe generally in, 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 in life, right? I mean, like, but uh, I think, yes. It's too late. No, but, <laughs> yeah, no, but the thing is in the music world, uh, people, know, oops, people, people know each other, right? And that was something that surprised me coming from Europe uh, to the United States because in Europe everything is a little bit small and it's more country by country, I had the feeling when I was in the UK, everybody in the UK knew each other, and then in Germany and Austria in this area, everybody knows each other, but it's all so close together. But then when I came to the US, um, I experienced that, yeah, it doesn't matter if it's East Coast, West Coast, Middle or so, you know, 
everybody in the orchestra has subbed there and knows this player, you know, it's, it's, it's very, it's, it can be very helpful. It was for me very helpful because when people like you, they might go to a different place, speak about you, you know, that's most probably how the Koblenz thing happened where I met Daniello, some, somebody talked to somebody. You two are very much alike. You're both professional classical musicians. You've traveled to many countries around the world. You speak multiple languages. I'm envious of all of the above. Have you been to Cuba? Have either of you been to Cuba? Oh, yes. You I mean, because in, Leo Brower lives there. Yeah, but everything for me started in Cuba, uh, speaking about my career, no? Because when I was 14, Brower came in Napoli to give a master class. So we met first time. That was 1986. Napoli being Agnello's hometown. Exactly, from Naples, Italy. And um, he invited me to go uh, in La Habana because at that time there was one of the most uh, important <clears throat> guitar competition all around the world. And I went there in 1988. I won that competition and from that time everything started. And then I back two years later in 1990 to have a um, concert tour all around Cuba. And uh, I love so much that country, so much. The most familiar piece on tonight's concert is the second one, the Concierto de Ajanuel by the Spanish composer Joaquin Rodrigo. Ajanuel, right in the middle of Spain, a bit south of Madrid, famous for its gardens in particular. Have either of you been to Ajanuel? I yeah. <laughs> He's better traveled than me. <laughs> I think the two countries in the world I have not been in was Spain and uh, Cuba. <laughs> That's the two. You caught me out there. <laughs> so you have both of those to look forward to. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So how many of you know the Concierto de Ajanuel? I thought most would, yeah, yeah. Are you familiar with the Miles Davis sketches of Spain? Recording? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. 1960 uh, arrangement of, of the piece for that yeah, yeah, jazz yeah. ensemble. I read that Rodrigo was not impressed with sketches of Spain, but I bet he enjoyed the royalties. <laughs> <laughs> would have gotten some money from that. Rodrigo was blind from the age of three, and he composed with a Braille system. Is there any other composer who didn't play the guitar who wrote for it as well as he did? No. No, so why I was he so good at writing for the guitar? He was a pianist. I don't know. The talent, sometimes you cannot explain no, how it comes. And uh, He was a genius. Huh? He was a genius. Uh, I mean, Aranquez is the most famous one. But he wrote so many pieces for guitar, uh, guitar and orchestra, duo, two guitar and orchestra, four guitar and orchestra. I mean, so many. And all of them really are beautiful. What about this one is most special or most difficult or most interesting for you? Aranquets, you mean? Well, Aranquets for us as a guitar player is the, the goal for us, no? It's, a, it's something... Uh, mm, uh, I started to play guitar because I heard Aranquets first time and I chose classical guitar. Over Pink Floyd? Exactly. <laughs> Good choice. <laughs> mistake. Absolute mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree with David. <laughs> I mean, when I recognize David Gilmour, the real son, then I <laughs> Apparently, it was not widely known for a very long time that the real heart of this concerto, the slow movement in the middle, the beautiful, sad, theme came about because the composer was mourning the death of a child. Uh, have you always known that about the piece? I didn't know that until just a few years ago. Uh, sorry, I... Uh, the can... slow movement in the Arnold yeah, yeah. concerto, he was mourning the miscarriage of a child shortly after he got married. Yeah, there are, there are different stories about, uh, mm. about that, no? Uh, because of the wife, the wife was healed, and because of the child. Uh, I, I guess that uh, 
in order to write something like the second movement of Aranquets, you must be touched from God. Or whatever it calls, or whatever it is. But it's, a, um, it's something which does not come from only a human being, I guess. Eh? That's why this melody went all around the world, and not only Miles Davis, but all the biggest players and the stars all around the world used the theme of Aranquets uh, in order to make uh, um, improvisation or whatever. So it's uh, unbelievable, really. The chances are good that it will be in your head as you leave here tonight and <laughs> maybe even tomorrow morning. We haven't talked about the symphony on the second half of the concert. Will you stay around and listen to that tonight? I think you can go for it. <laughs> no, I mean, when you play the second half of the concert oh. tonight, Dawson's symphony, you'll, you'll sit up there and listen, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, why'd you pick this piece? This piece is somewhat the center, and it's very good that it's like in classical 10th week out of 18 weeks. It's somehow, in some ways, the centerpiece of our season uh, on the concept that we found for the season. Um, I'm not getting tired of talking about how the idea of heritage of composers and how their heritage influences uh, their writing and should, I think, influence their writing uh, is a very central theme that goes for the whole season. I explained that with different programs. Uh, and uh, the Dawson Symphony and uh, the Dvorak New World Symphony together as a pairing, we will play the Dvorak uh, in a couple of uh, weeks, um, are the two pieces that kind of like, I think inspired us the most to that. And uh, the reason for that is uh, Dawson wanted to write a symphony that only a black man in America could write. He made it very clear in letters that there was, that was his intention. He wanted to use the regular classical orchestra, so he wanted to write a symphony in the tradition somehow of the uh, great symphonies, um, but he wanted to make sure that anybody who hears that piece says, this was not written by a white European composer. And uh, I think he completely succeeded, you know? His uh, inspirations range from spirituals, jazz, uh, African folk music, uh, he actually revised the symphony. He went to Africa uh, later after the premiere and then listened more to the you know, actual uh, Af African uh, melodies and rhythms and then revised the symphony to have even more of that influence. And I think what he did succeed in is becoming a real successor to the plan that Dvorak laid out. When Dvorak came to America and wrote his New World Symphony, where he himself, uh, Dvorak, didn't so much pull on uh, Czech melodies, but on you know, Native American melodies, spirituals, he wrote in a letter, and he very much openly advo advocated that the future of American music should be based on the American culture. And he made it very simple. He said, like an Austrian composer to, pulls from the Austrian folk music, a Spanish composer pulls from the Spanish folk music, an American composer sh should pull from all the treasures that are there uh, and, and, and then use that to create symphonies. And I think Dawson, most probably in, 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 in 1934, in the most remarkable way, did that. He clearly, very, very, very consequently followed that path and tried to set a blueprint for what a absolute American symphony would be. In no other country of the world could that piece have been written. Dvorak would love it. Dvorak would be so impressed. That I, I think that was exactly, I think th this kind of like Dawson symphony was exactly what Dvorak had in mind when he spoke about how the, how the American uh, symphonies should progress. And there's also, so we have a, a Cuban piece to begin and then the Spanish piece and then this all American piece based on spirituals. But that links back, in a way, to Leo Brower, because you're familiar with the term Afro-Cuban. A great deal of Cuban culture is there because of the people who came from, against their will, or not, Africa. Yeah. So there's a really interesting program with all these different threads and connections. The Dawson Symphony, as you said, uses the usual orchestra. But there's one sound in it that's a little odd. There's a loud, metallic, clanking sound which is kind of disquieting, some kind of percussion instrument, 
Yeah, it says uh, the African, uh, no, it's, uh, I forgot, uh, my, my name memory is absolutely terrible, but that's an instrument that he, uh, I think, you know, discovered. And these guys uh, had Africa. one? Sorry? The orchestra had one? Well, I mean, I guess they rented one. You know, I'm not, I'm yeah. not in the details. I, I thankfully don't have to source the instruments. That would, actually, that was very interesting. We had a dis discussion about it two days ago about how our principal percussionist is so brilliant at organizing that. And you know, because thinking about the jobs, what you see, of course, uh, in the concert hall is you know the people playing, and so it's the fi finished product. But yeah, it's actually very interesting to talk about that. Uh, among other uh, duties of a principal percussion player is you know, helping with finding the instruments and finding the right type of instrument and then assigning the parts, who plays what in the percussion. So that's something that Michael had to do. <laughs> this is a fun time to be alive in many ways. And one of those ways is that we're hearing so much music in classical music that's been overlooked, like this symphony by Dawson. People are really making the effort now to find things by black composers, female composers, all kinds of overlooked composers. Thank you for doing that. I, I have to say, I always did that since I'm pretty young and I always had a fascination for that. And when I came to America, I'm more focused, of course, on, you know, uh, maybe neglected American music, but uh, very early on. And, and that was what inspired me to really be, show interest in that when I was maybe 25. I was invited uh, to a concert uh, that was music by exiled or killed Jewish composers. Now that was very close to my heart because I come from, uh, partly from my mother's side, Jewish heritage and uh, part of my family has been killed in the Holocaust. And so uh, doing that concert opened my eyes that there is uh, really incredible music out there that was lost somehow or neglected because, you know, simply the circumstances. And then when I, when I came to America, I took, I think, this curiosity with me and thought like, yeah, I mean, in every culture, everywhere, there are pieces that I think personally should be played, right? I'm not playing pieces that I don't have an interest in or fascination. But when I listened to the Dawson Symphony, I was like, I like that piece. I want to do it. <laughs> You're also planning, the name Mahler came up. You're also planning to do a Mahler Symphony here every season? I read that somewhere. So, sounds, sounds about like what I would do, yeah? <laughs> I, I don't know how much I'm allowed to give away about the next season or so because our announcement will be in, what, three, four weeks or so. It wouldn't be a Mahler Symphony <laughs> on next okay. season. <laughs> Is there a guitar piece that you haven't played yet that you'd like to play? Well, uh, which I like to play, no. I played almost everything I like it. But there are so many guitar pieces which I did still not play. Uh, Have you commissioned works? Uh, no, but I was lucky that uh, many composers wrote for me. Do you compose? No. Or arrange? I tried and then I understand it's better to do what you can. Yeah. Oh, it's the same with me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> same story. Yeah. Why I went into radio, as a matter of fact. How has it been, this first season, for you, David Donsmeyer? Very, very, very good. And uh, I can tell you why. Because uh, the orchestra you have here in Portland, in Oregon, is wonderful. And that uh, makes me very happy. Um, I said that when I took over from Carlos, right? And, you know, Carlos is a conductor I really respect. It's, it's nice to be able to answer questions like this completely honestly without having to wiggle around or something. And for me, uh, this orchestra is very special. It was very special from the first minutes on that I conducted them. I remember the first time I came, now it's like maybe four years ago, I was immediately incredibly impressed and I am continue to be impressed. I mean, this week is hard for the orchestra. The Dawson is unknown, the Leo Brauer piece is unknown to the orchestra and so the amount of practice, preparation, and sheer joy and willingness this orchestra brings to the rehearsals, to the concerts, uh, the, 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 real, the real will they have to perform for the audience and to be there for Portland and, and for the people here is wonderful. That's, that's something you cannot create. That's something that's, uh, um, when you add all the people together in the orchestra, that's something that happens. And that's something that I cannot take any credit for. It's just a beautiful group of people. Wonderful. One thing I really like about this concert, I like pieces where there are lots of solo bits in the orchestra. 
two big English horn solos tonight. Oh, yeah. But also, there are solos for oboe and flute and horn and cello, and so you just get these people being able to step forward for a few measures and then step back. That color is so delightful, and we kind of feel like we get to know the individuals yeah. a little bit. So, in many ways, you are in for a really delightful concert this evening. Thank you very much for being Thank here. You. Thank you. Thank Robert you. Dunsmeyer, I'm Yellow Desiderio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.